Some men aren't looking for anything logical, like money. They can't be bought, bullied, reasoned, or negotiated with. Some men just want to watch the world burn. Imagine, if you can, for a moment, not having a conscience. You feel no guilt or remorse, no matter what kind of selfish, lazy, harmful, irresponsible, or immoral action that you engage in. In other words, your psychological makeup is radically different from the majority of people. You're completely free from internal restraints, and more interestingly, nobody else seems to understand that this is the case. With enough intelligence and planning, you could get everything that you've ever wanted and do anything at all. What is your dream life? How would you live if you had no limits? Believe it or not, this type of person actually exists. We call them sociopaths. In fact, as of the writing of today's book, The Sociopath Next Door, about 4% or 1 in every 25 people in the United States are sociopathic. And this statistic is based on the American Psychiatric Association's Standard for Antisocial Personality Disorder. The characteristics of someone who suffers from antisocial personality disorder are a failure to conform to social norms, deceitfulness or manipulativeness, impulsivity or a failure to plan ahead, irritability or aggressiveness, reckless disregard for the safety of yourself or others, consistent irresponsibility, and a lack of remorse after having hurt, mistreated, or stole from another person. According to the standards, a person could have antisocial personality disorder if they possess at least three of the seven characteristics. And other characteristics that are commonly associated with sociopaths are a superficial charm, a greater than normal need for stimulation, a lack of conscience, and a shallowness of emotion, which we'll touch on again later. But one of the more interesting things that I learned from this book is that not all sociopaths are violent. In fact, the vast majority of them are non-violent. They may steal without remorse. They may undermine us from behind closed doors at the office. They may seduce their victims into a loveless marriage, but most are not violent. Now, I opened the video with a quote from Alfred, partly because I just watched The Dark Knight for the first time a few days ago, and it's been on my mind a lot, and also because the Joker character was quite clearly sociopathic, and also partly because we have no idea where someone like the Joker could possibly come from. He tells a couple of stories in the movies, but they kind of conflict with each other. We're not really sure which is true, or if either of them is true. And sadly, the same holds true for real life. We don't really know what causes sociopathy. Some experts believe that it's passed on genetically, and while that may be partially true, personality traits such as empathy, which of course the sociopath lacks, only has a heritability rating of 35 to 50 percent according to several studies. So genetics may play a part in the equation, but at most, it's only half the equation. Other experts believe that the way the sociopath is nurtured from a young age plays a vital role in it. And I mean, wouldn't that make more sense? A child who's suffered through tons of abuse from a young age would have a slightly higher probability of showing sociopathic traits than a child who had a wonderful childhood? Well, maybe. But unlike many other psychological conditions like substance abuse, depression, and chronic anxiety, childhood abuse seems to play almost no role in the development of a sociopath. In fact, there's a fair amount of evidence that suggests that sociopaths are less influenced by the quality of family life and other early experiences than the rest of us are. Another possible factor that experts have proposed is the effect of culture on sociopaths. According to the statistics, sociopathy is relatively uncommon in certain East Asian countries like Taiwan, Japan, and China. Only about a tenth of a percent of the population, or one in a thousand people in Taiwan, suffer from antisocial personality disorder, compared to the 4% of the U.S. population. Although similar to the nature and nurture arguments, there's only a limited amount of solid evidence to support the culture argument. Again, the fact of the matter is, we don't truly know what causes sociopathy. But we do know that sociopaths exist, and they can cause us a tremendous amount of psychological harm. So that begs the question, how can you tell if someone is a sociopath? Unfortunately, and I hate to keep coming back to this, it's just the nature of the world we live in sometimes, there is no foolproof strategy for figuring out if someone's a sociopath. But when trying to figure out who to trust, or who not to trust in this case, there is one thing that you should definitely watch out for, and that is the pity play. It is arguably the most universal behavior of unscrupulous people, because we tend to do a lot more for people who we feel sympathetic towards than for those who we feel no sympathy for. And while these feelings are often used for good, I mean, it's what gets us to help those deserving people who have just fallen on hard times, it's also the feeling that the sociopath wants to get out of us, because it allows them to continue playing their game. So again, not a perfect strategy, but certainly something to keep an eye out for if you're concerned about whether or not you can trust someone you're getting close to. Now, I want to bring you back to the questions that I asked at the beginning of the video. What do you want most? What's your dream life? Is it to have money, power, 
a home on the beach somewhere, maybe the freedom to do whatever you want? How would you live if you had no limits? And if you had the choice, would you get rid of your conscience in order to get that dream life? Now, I think that most of us would probably answer no to that last question. Well, there may be that rare moment here and there where it would be tempting to act ruthlessly in order to get what we want. Most of us wouldn't do it in the end. The guilt we'd feel for hurting others just so that we could get what we wanted a little bit faster would be just too costly. In the end, conscience usually wins out. And we should be thankful for that. Because as it turns out, there's actually a reason, I mean beyond the moral ones, that we would want to never choose the path of a highly successful sociopath. Assuming we actually had the option in the first place. You know how I said that a sociopath's psychological makeup is radically different than our own? Well, as it turns out, the same is true at a neurobiological level. Several studies have proven that a sociopath's cerebral cortex actually reacts a lot differently than most people's to emotional stimuli. For most of us, our brains will recognize words with emotional weight, like love, faster than words that don't have any emotional weight, like look. And this also extends to other things like facial expressions. And this is shown in the electrical activity of our brain. But instead of seeing their electrical levels spike when presented with emotional words or other stimuli, the sociopath's brain shows an increased blood flow to the temporal lobes. Basically, what these findings suggest is that sociopathy is more than just the absence of conscience and a list of characteristics. It's also the inability to process an emotional experience. This is the shallowness of emotion that I mentioned earlier. And I ask you, what good is all the money, power, and freedom in the world if, on a fundamental level, you can't even enjoy it. So that was The Sociopath Next Door, and if you learned something and like what you saw here, be sure to subscribe. I will be back next week for part three of my review of Robert Greene's book, Mastery. But until then, thanks for watching, and have a great day.